Well, good morning. How are you guys doing this morning? All right. It's a beautiful day outside. I'm glad you're here with us this morning. If I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, my name is Stephen, and I'm one of the pastors here, and I just want to welcome you here to Seymour Christian. I, I already heard someone say those sounded like Dan jokes, if you were reading the screen. Yep. Yep. What do you think? Yep. Did Dan write all those? No, he didn't. But uh, he has said some of those jokes before. Uh, but we're going to be talking a little bit about what's going to happen in service in a moment. But a couple of things I just want to let you know about. If this is your first time here, your first time in a long time, I want to welcome you. I ask for you to fill out a connection card. It's found inside your bulletin. Looks like this. You probably got one on your way in. If you didn't, we'd love for you to grab one on your way out. You can also scan the QR code that's there, uh, and it gives us a way just to connect with you, get to know you a little bit more, and help you on your journey uh, to be more like Jesus. And so we're just grateful that you're here with us. If uh, you would love to give to our, our congregation as we continue to be a church that lives and gives generously to mission here, right in this building, here in this community, and around the world, uh, there's ways you can do that online in our giving boxes by the door as well. And so thank you uh, for being a church that is living and giving generously. This morning, uh, a couple things you might have noticed when you came into our lobby there in our new connection area, we had some folks out there that are part of the Partners in Education ministry. And that's a ministry that's been going on here for many, many years through our support of the Dominican Republic. This church has partnered with Michel Marte at the Dominican Republic, and he is running a school there for elementary age students. And each year we like to sponsor as many of those kids as we can that are not able to pay for that school. And uh, so it, through your generous donations, uh, we are hoping to sponsor over 70 kids. Uh, we already have three of them covered that were covered through our Vacation Bible School kids. You heard about that last week that raised money to help those. But for $150, you can sponsor a kid for their entire year of school. That includes their supplies, uh, all the materials they might need, as well as a school uniform if they're not able to get that. And so if you'd like to find out more about how you can partner with our Partners in Education program, right outside these doors at the connection desk there, uh, after service, there'll be some people there. They can answer any questions questions you might have. You can sign up right then and there uh, to sponsor a child. You can pay for the full year. You can pay in installments. They have all the uh, an answers you might need. There's also information inside your bulletin. But we're going to be doing that for the next two weeks. And so I want to encourage you to, uh, to partner with that Partners in Education program to sponsor those kids. There's a couple of things I want to make sure I don't forget anything else. Oh, yes. So this morning, uh, you might have noticed things are looking a little bit different here in our service. And on this fifth Sunday, this weekend, we have given our uh, clubhouse and our children's ministry volunteers the day off. Uh, for many of them. And so those kids are in here with us. Many of them uh, in our children, our children's church program are with us here. Let's welcome them here this morning. Our kids are here. Yeah. And because of that, uh, we have decided, as Dan told me, it's, it's a history here that on the fifth Sunday, many, many years ago, the kids would come in and to what we call big church. And so what we're doing this morning is we're bringing the clubhouse experience to you. And so this morning, what we're going to have, we have our worship is going to be, yeah, we're excited about that. We have some of the, the worship songs that they do in the clubhouse that you guys are familiar with as well, but there's going to be a little bit of extra something, something to them as they're going to do some motions. And I'm going to encourage you guys to try to do those motions as well. You're going to see them up on the screen. Uh, yeah, right. Someone said, you guys can do these. If I can do them, I know you can. Uh, they're not too cardiovascular. You know, you're not going to get your heart up too much for those. So I think we can do that. Uh, but we're going to hear a message from one of our clubhouse teachers and our communion is going to be led uh, by some of our clubhouse teachers. And so we're just excited, kids, to have you in here with us. And we hope that this morning is a fun time for you and your families and for all of us as we celebrate Jesus and as we learn about him. But to get our time going together this morning, I have a few questions because what they do in, in the clubhouse is it's an interactive experience. And so I'm going to ask you some questions, and I'd just love to hear some of your responses. This can be kids, adults, just shout it out. This is probably the only time I'll let you shout at me without me getting offended, all right? So go ahead. And what is the best gift that you've ever been given or received? Salvation? Okay, yeah. Ender, what do you got? What's the best gift you ever got? What do you say? Love. That's a great one. You guys are giving the real answers here. I expect someone to be like, you know, a new jacket or something. <laughs> Anybody else? The best gift you ever given and received? Yes. Aaliyah. 
God, yes, that's a great gift too. Next question. What is something you would never give away? You're, you're, Les said my wife, but the way you said that, Les, my wife. I think you meant to say my wife, right? Yes. What's something you never give away? Your Nintendo Switch. All right. Yeah. Yes, back there. He forgot. Me too. All right. The next question. Let's see. We're going to do one more here. Uh, what gift does God give his children? Grace. Let's go to what else? What else does God give his children? Peace. Peace. Love. Forgiveness. We could go on for the rest of the service just with that, aren't we? And we are so grateful that God has given us so many gifts. And that actually leads us to our theme for this morning. And our theme verse, or our theme for this morning, is God can use my gifts, so I should give generously. God can use my gifts, so I should give generously. In the rest of our service, we're going to hear more about that. And Dan is going to be bringing us a message that reminds us and demonstrates for us in a very fun way how God can use my gifts, so I should give generously. So I want to ask us all to stand. I'm going to pray over our service, and we're going to go on in our worship in just a moment. God, we thank you for the opportunity we have to be in this room together to celebrate you as a family, one big church family. God, we thank you for the gifts that you have given us. Everything from Nintendo switches to salvation and love. Lord, we thank you for all of that. We praise you this morning. God, I pray for all of us in here this morning that everything we do would point to Jesus. Help be with us as we learn from your word, as we hear from your word, and as we give you praise. In the name of Jesus, we pray, and the church together said... Amen. All right, one more thing they do in the clubhouse before they start worship every Sunday is they do some stretches, all right? So I was ex explained how you're supposed to do the stretches. You got to go up as far as you can go, everybody, all right? And then if you can touch your toes, which I can't, as far down as you can go, don't hurt yourself. Don't hurt yourself, all right? We're turn to the right. Give it a little stretch on the back. Turn to the left, all right? One more time, up and sideways. We got some kids that are going to come on up here, and they're going to help lead us in worship. You guys ready? Let's worship together this morning. Good morning, church. It's so good to see you all this morning. We've got our lovely dance team up here, so just go ahead and follow these motions. the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging seas. My God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out Prisoners, now we're running free. We are 
forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by Shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out. Good job, guys. Good job to all of you. I saw lots of dancing out there. We're going to keep going. It's so good. We've got one more song for you today. We were waiting without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt
Good morning, church family. <clears throat> Stephen asked the question earlier, what gifts does God give to his children? I want you to think about some of those answers. Um, peace, forgiveness, love, grace, courage, generosity, kindness. <clears throat> All of those gifts are important, and all of them are essential, and I believe they all come from God. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, verses 14 through 20, Paul gives us an example of why each person's specific gifts matter. And it says, <clears throat> Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body. It would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, would not for that reason, uh, where would the sense of hearing be? And if the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. We all have gifts that are unique and specific to us. What are your gifts? Do you know what makes you special? In the world, it's easy to forget what makes you special. Most likely, it looks different than the person sitting next to you. Some gifts seem important, while others seem less important. But God gave us the greatest gift of all time, and that gift was his son, Jesus. No other gift has been as important or needed in the history of the world. Jesus left heaven to live a perfect, sinless life on earth, and was crucified on the cross for our imperfect, sinful lives. And we get to use this time each week as an opportunity to remember that sacrifice and to examine ourselves. The bread, to remember his body that was broken for us. Take and eat. The juice, to remember his blood, that was poured out for us. Take and drink. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the gifts that you have given each one of us. Thank you most of all for the gift of your son, Jesus. We ask that you would help us remember that gift and keep our focus on you this week. We pray that you would help us to know your will in our lives and that you would show us how to use our gifts for your kingdom. We thank you, Father, for your never-ending love for us. We pray that you would help us to pour that love out to those around us. Father, please be with Dan as he brings us the words he has prepared through his time studying with you. Calm his nerves and help him to be your vessel. Lord, we we ask that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. I pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. That's perfect. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, you can do better than that. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to Children's Church today. We've been studying this month. June is the month of Judges, so we've been looking at the Judges. And I know a lot of you have been absent from Children's Church for the last few weeks, so I'll try to catch you up to date. The Judges was a, a turbulent time in many ways for God's people, that uh, oftentimes they were oppressed by the neighbors around them. And I thought it's just like that is ripped out of the headlines of today, isn't it? But God's people were being oppressed on all sides. And God's plan for leadership of his people, at, this is after Moses and after Joshua helped them conquer the Holy Land, their, their place that God gave them. Then God's plan was that he would raise up a judge and the judge would be in charge of God's people. 
then he would speak to his people through the prophets. And that was God's plan. And so whenever a judge would come and live and then they would die, God would choose the next judge. It was totally different than kings because when a king dies, who becomes the next king? Oh, I need everybody's eyes here with me. <laughs> okay. Uh, when a king died, who would be the next king? Exactly, his son. When a judge died, who would be the next judge? whoever God chose. So that was God's plan of his leading his people. He would choose the judge and he would choose the prophet and the prophet would speak for his people. And that was going really well until God's people said, we want to be like all the other countries in the world. Now, did God want his special country to be like all the other countries of the world? No, he wanted them to be special, to be separate, set apart, to be holy. But they complained over and over, God, we want a king. We want to be like the other countries. Part of that was because they saw that when kings would get together an army and would defeat their enemies, then they could plunder. And I think they wanted wealth that they didn't work for. They wanted to steal from their neighbors. And so God would call up, uh, God told them over again that you do not want a king, trust me. Kings are bad to their people. Kings take stuff. If you have a really good horse, guess what the king I don't want a king trust me but the people said over and over they wanted a king and so finally God relented he said okay I'll give my people what they ask for over and over and he calls the final judge now in the book of judges we find 13 judges there's a 14th, and his name is Samuel. And we studied Samuel a week ago. He's a little boy that you remember the story. His mother, Hannah, could not have children. And she was a devout follower of God. And she prayed over and over throughout her life, Dear God, please give me a son. She even on one occasion makes a promise to God that God, if you'd give me a son, I would give him back to you and he would serve you all the days of his life. And we studied last week Samuel. As when Samuel's old enough, his mom takes him to the tabernacle and drops him off with the high priest Eli. And uh, he is serving there. She gets to see him once a year when she comes to worship and sacrifice. But other than that, he is raised in the tabernacle helping Eli, uh, who he'll eventually replace as the high priest. But he's the one you'll remember when he's little. He, gets, he hears a voice in the night, you know, Samuel, Samuel. And he gets up and goes to Eli and says, what do you need, master? And, he's, and Eli says, it's not me. Go back to bed. This happens four times. On the fourth time, he says, hey, the next time it happens, tell, tell the voice, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And Samuel begins a relationship that night with God. He says, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And God tells him the plan he has for his life. And Samuel is one of the few people in the Bible who serves God his whole life. We have lots of examples of people who serve God when they're young, but then something happens when they get older that their faith falls away. But Samuel's one of those few who serve God their whole life. And I just want to say before we get to the, the skit that there is nothing, kids, you can do with your life that's more important than this. There's no education, no experience, nothing of value that you can achieve or purchase that's more important than you having a relationship with God. Begin now, and the rest of your life, value that more than anything else. Talk to God, spend time with God, study his word, do the things he would do. That's one thing I learned from Samuel, that Samuel was for a lifetime faithful, and God used him in amazing ways. And as uh, Stephen said earlier today, we are going to be talking about how God can use my gifts so I can use, so I should give them generously. I'm going to ask you to say that sentence with me, if you would, please. God can use my gifts so I should give generously. And today we've got for your, I think, enjoyment. I think it's okay if we have fun when we learn about God's word. I found like 150 times it says you should be joyful when you're in the house of the Lord. So I think it's okay if we smile and enjoy as we learn truths of God. So I'm going to ask my actors and actresses to go up on the big stage, please. I do need Samuel and the two little girls to be very far to the left. So Samuel, yeah, will you take the two girls? Everyone else, I need to start at center stage, if you'll start there, please. And I will remind my crew of the rules, but I'll let you know, not the rules, the, the way we do skits is 
Um, when I first say your name, would you guys please wave to the crowd because they don't know who's who. So that way they'll figure out who's who. Um, when there's a talking part, I usually let them talk, but I didn't want to find nine microphones and make it all work. So I'm actually gonna read your guys' lines today, but I'm gonna ask you to act like you're talking. Do something that lets me know, like if it says, and then Saul said, blah, 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 blah. Okay, see, that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's, he's perfectly typecast for this part. Um, and we're going to ask our actors and actresses, do exactly what it says. Like if it says they did this or did that, we want you to be true to the text. I'm not changing the Bible at all. I am going to be reading for, from 1 Samuel parts of uh, chapter 9 and then a little bit in uh, chapter 10. And let's begin. There was once a man... A Benjamite, a man of good standing, whose name was Kish. Whose name was Kish. <laughs> he was the son of Abiel and of the tribe of Benjamin. Kish had a son whose name was Saul. <laughs> he was a handsome young man. <laughs> as could be found anywhere in all of Israel. He was a head taller than anyone else. <laughs> now, Kish had some donkeys that belonged to him and his son Saul. Donkeys, there you go. And one day they were lost. They were lost. Go sit, go sit with Jeffrey. They were lost. And Kish said to his son Saul, take one of the servants and go and look for the donkeys. So Saul and his servant passed through the country of Ephraim, through the country of Ephraim, no, through the country of Ephraim, <laughs> but they did not find them there. They next looked in the district of Shalim. In the district of Shalim, good. But the donkeys were not there. Then he passed through the territory of Benjamin. But they did not find them there. When finally they reached the district of Zuf, Saul said to his servant who was with him, Come, let's go back, or my father will stop thinking about the donkeys and start worrying about us. But the servant replied, Look, in this town there is a man of God. He is highly respected, and everything he says comes true. Let's go there now. Perhaps he will tell us which way we should take. But Saul said to his servant, If we go... <laughs> what could we give the man? The food in our sacks is all gone. <laughs> we have no gift to take to the man of God. The servant answered him, Look, I have a quarter of a shekel of silver. I will give it to the man of God, and he will tell us which way we should take. Good, said Saul. Let's go. So they set out for the town where they knew the man of God was. As they were going up towards the hill of the town, they met some young women who were coming out, good, who were coming out to draw water. They were coming out <laughs> to draw water. And they asked the girls, Is the seer here today? He is, they answered him. He's just ahead of you. If you hurry now, you will see him before you get to the town. For the people have scheduled a, for the people have scheduled a sacrifice in the high place. As soon as you enter town, you will find him before he goes up to the high place to eat. Go now, 
you should find him at this time. So Saul and his servant went up into the town. Oh, girls, you can just come down. And as they were entering the town, they found Samuel, who was coming towards them on the way to the high place. Now the day before this, the Lord had revealed this to Samuel. About this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. Anoint him ruler over your people Israel. He will deliver them from the hand of the Philistines. I have looked on my people, for their cry has reached me. So when Samuel caught sight of Saul, the Lord again spoke to him and said, This is the man I spoke to you about. He will govern my people. So Saul approached Samuel in the gateway and said to him, Would you please tell me where the seer is? Samuel replied, I am the seer. Go up ahead of me to the high place, for today you are to eat with me, and in the morning I will send you on your way, and I will tell you all that is in your heart. As for your donkeys, they have been found. The, do not worry about them. They are with your father. And to whom is all the desire of Israel turned, if not to you and to your family? Saul answered him, But am I not a Benjamite? from the smallest tribe of Israel? And is not my clan the least of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why do you say such a thing to me? That was, that was Saul's line. Why do you say such a thing to me? Yeah. No. The next day, as they were going to the edge of town, Samuel said to Saul, tell your servant to go on ahead of us. And the servant did so. But you stay here for a while so that I can give you a message from the Lord. Then Samuel took a flask of olive oil and poured it on his head. <laughs> and poured it. And poured it. No, 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 you don't have to. You don't have to. And he said to him, The Lord has anointed you the ruler over his inheritance. And then he kissed him. <laughs> All right, can we give our actors and actresses a fine round of applause? And you, guys, you guys can go back to Miss Bonnie and she'll help you. All right, everybody. Good job. Wasn't that a great show? Yeah. Okay, crowd participation. And I noticed earlier you had your church answers on. We often have kids that will like raise their hand and whatever the question is, the answer is Jesus. Jesus. I even had one time I asked the kids, hey, does anybody know who Jesus' mommy, what her name was? A little hand goes up and they say, Jesus. And I was like, no, Jesus was not Jesus' mommy. So I, I want you to not just have your, your church gear on, okay? Let's, let's think as we go through. Why did Saul go on a journey today. Why did Saul go on a journey? Yes. Yes, exactly right, to find his donkeys. Um, isn't it weird? Did you notice in the story how God tells Saul, I'm sorry, God tells Samuel, I'm going to make a king. He's going to be the best young man. He's going to be young, handsome. He's going to be strong. He's going to be brave. He's going to be a good decision maker. He's going to be a great leader. And I want you to make him the king. And Samuel's thinking, you know, there's about, you know, the, the, the country at this time is probably 8 to 10 million people. He's thinking, how in the world am I going to find this kid of all this nation? And God says, don't worry, I'll bring him to you. And then what does God have happen? The perfect young man loses his donkeys and goes to look for them in the town where Samuel is that day. Did you notice that in the story? how God sometimes causes in our lives things to happen, things we don't understand, things that we wish would not happen, and things that sometimes we pray to God he would take away from us. But sometimes God causes things to happen because he has a bigger plan. And that he, he's playing chess while we're playing checkers. And God 
has a plan for our lives and uses people. So why did you notice in the story, why was Samuel in Zuff? I've no, has anybody here ever been to Zuff before? Now, when I first read this book, I thought it was a Dr. Seuss word. Um, Zuff. Why was Samuel in Zuff? Did you catch that? Yeah, he went for a feast. Samuel's the judge of the land. He has been told by God to rule his people, and Samuel is using his gift for God, and he's using it generously. He's been told to rule these people, to make decisions. And when you read through the book of 1 Samuel, you see so many times if there's a dedication somewhere, or if there's a conflict somewhere, or if there's a special day going to be celebrated, Samuel goes to help the people. His gift was leading, decision-making, encouraging And that's what Samuel's all about, and he is always found faithful in doing his job for God. So what did God tell Samuel to do in this story? He told him, what's that? Yes, I've noticed the A students always sit towards the front of the class. Um, Yeah, he told him to anoint this young man as the king. Not something Samuel was really a big fan of, but he did it anyway. And oh, the conversation. There's one other time they talked about gifts. When the servant and Saul were going to meet Samuel, what, what, was, uh, what was Saul's main concern? He says, we don't have a gift. Why would he be concerned about that? Yeah. Uh, Moses started it. He said, I will not go to the house of the Lord empty-handed. In other words, part part of our gifts is finances as well as the talents, the abilities, the wisdom, the knowledge that God has given to us. And when Saul finds out, he went looking for donkeys, okay? He woke up that morning a lost donkey searcher, okay? And by the time he goes to bed that night, he finds out he is what? He's the king of the world, or the king of his nation. And did you notice um, his response? shows incredible, beautiful humility. He says, are you kidding me? I'm the least in my family. My family is the least in our clan. Our clan is the least in Benjamin, and Benjamin is the least of the 12 tribes. In other words, he's saying, I am the lowest man in this whole nation. How are you making me king? And I thought, that's the humility we need to have. God gives us gifts. And if we have great things, and if we have accomplished great things, it is not because we are great people. It's because our God is a great God who gives generously his gifts. Too many times we think the things that I have and the person that I've become is because I am so cool. I am so awesome. I am such a hard worker. I deserve this. And we fail to lose fact that it's God who controls, and it's this universe is in orbit because of him and things are sustained because of him. Now we know Saul later in his life is not that humble young man anymore. And we see he's one of those guys that started off good and didn't end up so well. But in his young life, he's getting better and or he is better than he was when he's older. Reminded me of, we studied a couple weeks ago because we're going through the judges, a man Gideon. Gideon is hiding because in his life, the Midianites are oppressing the people, and he is hiding in a wine press while the battle is beginning. And the angel of the Lord comes to him and says, oh, I have it, there it is. God is with you, mighty man of valor. (laughs) Okay, where is he when the angel finds him? He's hiding in a wine press. And God says to him, God is with you, mighty man of valor. Is he a mighty man of valor at that moment? No. God is able to see who you will be. God doesn't judge, we're told, in the life of David. God doesn't see people the way man sees people because God looks at the heart. And God is looking at the heart of Saul, knowing what kind of leader he will be for years for God's people. Reminds me also of a little boy that, uh, remember Jesus was feeding, uh, was with 5,000 in the wilderness preaching, and the people were complaining that they were hungry. And one little boy, Philip found, who had two fish and five little loaves of bread. And Jesus took that tiny, humble gift and fed 5,000 to the point, who remembers how, many, how much was left over? Who said that? 10 bonus points for today. 
Um, there were 12 baskets full of leftovers. The so complete was God's bounty from such a small gift. And kids and big kids in the room today, I want you to know that God can take your gift, even if you think it's small, even if you think it's insignificant, God can take your gift that you give to him and he can make it make a difference in people's lives. We're going to have a New Testament lesson, then we're going to continue on with a couple more things. Um, we're going to turn, if you have your Bibles, to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I think it's going to pop up on screen. But Paul is writing these exact same things that we are talking about in Judges here today. I'm sorry, in 1 Samuel here today. Let's read together. But since you excel in everything, in faith and speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. And here is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work, so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it, according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable, according to what one has not according to what one needs. I think what Paul is saying is three points. And the first one is exactly what we're talking about today. He starts off that paragraph by saying, God can use my gifts, so I should give generously. That's our theme for today. Don't hold anything back. In, in the, the questions that Stephen was asking at the very beginning, um, when he asked, what's the best gift you were ever given? I was hoping you would think of a gift you were given by a person in your life. And you would start thinking of, oh, I've got, you know, I remember mine was an electric train set. I was probably about eight. And my dad bought me this little HO scaled electric train set. And I just loved that thing. Played with it for years. Um, but I've noticed in our lives that we've all been given many gifts. If you add together the birthdays and Father's Days and Christmases and baby showers, wedding showers. We've been given so many gifts by people. And there are very few that we have that we would not share. I have a couple things that if you ask to borrow, I would say no, truthfully, because they're too precious. They're too important. They're too irreplaceable to me. And I thought at times, I think we approach God in the same way we approach people. The, if you ask for some things in my life, I would, yeah, yeah, come on, yeah. Here, you, hey, Dan, can I borrow your ink pen? Sure. Dan, can I borrow your preaching Bible? Yeah, sure. A um, hundred times I'd say yes. But if you had asked me for, well, there's a couple things my grandpa gave me. I wouldn't, I wouldn't share those. They're too precious. But I think we've done the same thing with our relationship with God. We've told God, yes, God, you can have most of the things I have. You can have most of my gifts, talents, abilities, but there's this one thing I'm gonna hold back, or maybe there's these two things. They're too precious to me that I don't wanna give them to you. But I wanna tell you today, whatever gift you would give to God, he will give back to you better. He will take every stain, every situation in our lives and make it better. So don't hold back your gifts. Don't hold your gifts back from God. Second thing I see Paul says here in 2 Corinthians 8 is sometimes God blesses us with too much so we should share generously. Do you know that's how God takes care of his body? Like Alex was talking about that some of us uh, are a nose, some are uh, an ear, some are eyes, some are feet, some are hands. That's on purpose because God wants us to learn that we need each other. No man is an island. He built you incomplete on purpose, and it is good that you need others. So you've got to bring, if you're the nose, you need to bring your smelling in here. 
If, you, if, you're, if you're an I, you need to bring your sense of sight. Um, I know the list that he read that some are equipped to be teachers, some are equipped to encourage, some are equipped to be generous. However God has made you, use it. And be generous because those around you need that from you. He's given too much to you on purpose. And then the last thing I see that Paul says in that last verse is that sometimes we need help from others. I, let's change that sometimes to always. Always we need help from others. So be humble and accept it. There are going to be times in your life you need help from somebody else. It's okay. It doesn't mean you're less of a person. God made you that way on purpose because he wants his body to be together and he will be the head of the body. And so you aren't everything at all times to all people, but you are enough for God today. Amen? Amen. Oh, come on. Amen? Amen. 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 That's right. That'll preach. Hey, we're going to go into our small group time right now, and I'm going to invite Brother Matthew. Would you please give a Seymour Christian Church welcome to Brother Matthew? All right, well, good morning. Hey, we're going to go into our small group time, and this is a bit large for a small group. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to separate you guys. I'm going to count you off by ones and twos and threes. No, I'm just kidding. We're not going to do that. That'd take forever. But what we are going to do is we're going to encourage you to have a conversation with the people that are around you. So if you're by yourself, scoot on down. There's a couple of you guys right here. And we want a, a, groups to be about four to eight people. And we're going to put some questions up on the screen and we want you to be honest. We want you to, how, how is this message, how can this affect you right here, right now, today? I mean, this story happened thousands of years ago, but it can still be relevant to where you are right now. And so I encourage you to do that right now, to turn around, to look down the aisle, to get close. We're family, right? We are not just strangers. I hope we're not strangers but that we are family. We are God's family. So if you will go, I'm going to read these as well, but they will be up on the screen. So Brad, if you'll put those up there for us. Here are your questions. What was Saul looking for and why did he go visit Samuel? I think we've already kind of answered this one. So maybe let's go to the next one. What did Samuel say to Saul and do for him? Why? The one after that, what gifts or talents do you have that God has given you? And what are some ways you can use your gifts for God? So you guys have a few minutes to discuss this with each other. Um, again, be honest with each other. Uh, there's no growth that can happen if you're just not talking. <laughs> All right, so I better hear some talking. All right, we're going to go ahead and um, take about 30 seconds more. Try to finish up, and we'll, we'll start in about 30 seconds. Okay, we always end our children's church times together with our memory verse. So, do you girls want to be up on stage so they see you better, or you want to be down on the floor with me? Okay. So, let me get like two on one side. How about two girls on one side, two girls on the other side? And I have them up here because I'm hoping that you will look at them and not look at me. If you want to. Just promise you won't fall. Do you promise? Okay. She promised. You heard her. Hudson, you going to help us too? Okay. Hey, um, we always do a memory verse. Part of the reason for that is the Bible says train up a child the way they should go and when they're old, they will not depart from it. Exactly right. So we hold on to that promise. It also says that when my word goes out, it will not come back to me void. So we're hoping that if we learn God's word, it will be like a shield or like a sword for us as we battle through life. And I think these things, I know scriptures that I learned in church camp when I was nine that I still have memorized. So I hope this is a great thing. And I encourage everybody here to make memorizing God's word part of your growth and your spiritual life. So we're going to start off sitting down so you can see the help a little bit better, but we'll end up standing. Our verse today comes from 1 John 
chapter 3, verse 1. Oh, you can do 3 this way if you want to, but I just always do it this way. So would you say that with me, please? 1 John, chapter 3, verse 1. Let's do it a little bit louder, a little bit prouder. 1 John, chapter 3, verse 1. And we're going to break the verse into two parts. Brad has been kind, and he has put it up on the board so that you can read it. And I'm going to encourage you, though, that later on to try to do it without looking at it. But the verse starts out like this. Look at what great love the Father has given us. Let's see if we can do that together. Look at what great love the Father has given us. One more time. Look at what great love the Father has given us. Let's start that from the beginning. I think we can do it all? Do you think we can do it all? Okay, I think so. First John chapter 3, verse 1. Look at how great a love the Father has given us. Let's do that one more time. 1 John 3, 1. Look at how great a love the Father has given us. And the verse ends this way. That we should be called God's children. And we are. Now, kids, when we do the end, oh, kids, can you, yeah, can you stand up? Because when we do the and we are, I want you to do it like this, like, and we are. Like, and we are. There you go. Like, you really, really mean it. All right, let's just do that last part. That we should be called God's children. And we are. I can't do that. It would really hurt me bad. So I'm going to count on you guys. One more time, all together. That we should be called God's children. And we are. We're going to try it from the very beginning all the way through. Okay, nice and slow so that everybody can say it together. Here we go. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Look at how great a love the Father has given us that we should be called God's children. And we are. Can you believe we did it? Let's do one. Good job. Actually, last time through, then we're going to take off, or Brother Stephen's going to come, then we'll take off. Bradley, could you make it so that those words are not on the screen? Yes. And could we ask the house of the Lord to stand together, please? And we are going to show God that we have learned a Bible verse today. Normally we go around the room and let everybody do it individually. But with a crowd like this, no, no. All right, last time, all together. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Look at how great a love the Father has given us that we should be called God's children. And we are. All right, good job. Thank you, kids, and thank you, Dan. And the rest, let's just give, you guys can have a seat. Go ahead. Let's give a round of applause to all of our children's ministry volunteers and workers who helped us this morning and all of our kids. Yeah. What a great morning. Just for you to experience a little bit of what they experience every Sunday over in the clubhouse. And I know that I learned something this morning, and I hope you did too. And this is a great opportunity for for me to remind you and to just ask you guys. We have so much fun over there uh, with the clubhouse and our children's ministry, and we need volunteers. Uh, It is very fun. It's exciting. It's a different experience every week. Uh, whether it's acting out things like that or just hanging out with the kids, supervising a little bit, checking them in, just being a friendly face and a smile for a lot of these kids uh, to, to be able to experience the love of Jesus Christ. And so I encourage you to prayerfully consider being part of our children's ministry volunteers. Uh, we have all sorts of ways you can get involved there. And so I just ask if you were interested at all in that to see Matt or Dan or myself or any of the 
the rest of the elders or staff, and they can point you in the right direction. But we would love for you to consider being part of our children's ministry. Uh, I, I used to say this a lot, that that is the next generation. It's not the next generation. It's today's generation. They are the church. They're not the coming church. They are the church. And we got to experience church here this morning as the body of Christ. So thank you for being here this morning. I want to remind you just on your way out to stop by the Partners in Education booth and consider sponsoring one of those kids. And I'm going to close this in a time of prayer. Just encourage you guys as we go off and start our week. God, we thank you for the lesson that we learned today, that you have given us all gifts And you've asked us, Lord, to use them generously. And so I pray that all the people in this room, no matter their age, Lord, would recognize that truth, that all of us have been blessed by you and all of us can give back generously. Put on our hearts ways that we can give generously today, tomorrow, next week, ways we can pour into this church, into our children's ministry, into our families and friends and our places of work. God, we thank you for the gifts you've given us and help us to use them for your glory. Pray you'd be with us this week. Bring us all together again. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And the church together said...